Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Vergo and I am uh, the happy dean of this uh, wonderful school of business and uh, economics. And it's my uh, honor, my pleasure, to welcome Professor Paul de Grouwe from the London School of Economics. And previous to that, he was at the Katholieke Universiteit Leuven. We are very pleased, indeed, that um, Professor Paul de Grouwe has accepted the invitation to deliver this first Johan Muisken lecture in collaboration with Studium Generale, because he is one of the most outspoken economists on European economic policy. And for all of you who know Johan Muisken, it is no surprise that Paul was the number one on Professor Muisken's list to deliver this first lecture since Johan, as you know, is very engaged in economic policy debates as well. In 2012, three years ago, Paul de Grauwe reached the legal age for mandatory retirement in Belgium, after which he was offered the John Paulson Chair in European Political Economy at the LSE, London School of Economics and Political Science, I should add. He retired from his position at the University of Leuven and at that moment he expressed his discontent with this legal retirement age, saying, I felt disparaged, like an old machine in a factory. Our Belgian legislation says you have become economically worthless, but I also felt struck in my identity as a person. You have to give people the freedom of choice if they want to continue working after their 65th birthday. End of story. I understand those who feel exhausted and quit, but I wanted to continue functioning academically, and this wasn't an option here in Belgium. So he had to go to the LSE. As I said prior to joining LSE, Paul was professor of international economics at the Universiteit of Leuven, KU Leuven. He was a member of the Belgian parliament from 91 till 2003. He is honorary doctor of the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, the University of Turku in Finland, and the University of Genoa in Italy. Paul obtained his PhD from the Johns, Johns Hopkins University in 74. He was a visiting professor at various universities, University of Paris, University of Michigan, Pennsylvania, Humboldt, um, Université Libre de Bruxelles, Université Catholique de Louvain, the French-speaking sister of the KU Leuven, Universiteit Amsterdam, Milan, Tilburg, Kiel, and so on. And so on. He was also a visiting scholar at the IMF, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank. He was a member of the Group of Economic Policy Analysis, advising President Barroso. He's also director of the Money Macro and International Finance Research Network, CECIFO, the University of Munich. He's a research fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. After retirement, <laughs> his research interests are and always have been international monetary relations, monetary integration, theory and empirical analysis of the foreign exchange markets, open economy, macroeconomics. He published books and including the uh, economics of the monetary union in Oxford, which was translated in 10 languages and is now in its eighth edition. Other books, International Money, Post-War Trends and Theories, The Exchange Rate in a Behavioral Finance uh, Framework uh, in Princeton and Oxford. Paul is very familiar with Maastricht University, with SBE, and with me at its current dean. I was a student in his class. I'll tell you a bit more later on. <laughs> He's a regular guest in Maastricht, Paul. I, me too, but Paul is a guest. I'm working here. He has uh, delivered lectures for Studium Generale for years. He's lectured in a course of monetary integration uh, that the Department of Economics has offered until 2005. Good, as a liberal, and now the important part, as a liberal, and advocate of the free market, he has long since been a strong proponent of the market economy and globalization. In his book, in his work, The Uncompleted Globalization, 
Written for a broader audience, he explains why he favors globalization and discusses the statements of anti-globalists, which he finds somewhat pessimistic. And Paul is everything but a pessimist. He sees himself as an optimist and believes that market forces and economic growth will offer a solution to issues related to natural resources, energy, environment, climate change, and so on. However, Professor de Grauwe has recently pointed out the necessity of government in this market economy. He said he used to uphold the financial markets as bearers of the truth, but now acknowledges that it is a world where rationality is intertwined with emotions. In an interview, he stated that certain entities are needed to correct market forces. Because of the global financial crisis, the need to correct the market is greater today than before. For this reason, his acknowledgement of a strong government has increased. <clears throat> Two things are striking. Paul is simple. Not simple in his head, but he's simple in his speech. Clarity of argumentation is priority number one. Paul is among the few economists who are able to reduce complex problems to the core and discuss these in clear terms without losing scientific background. It's a Nobel Prize winner, Paul Krugman, who said, I would have loved to have written the articles Paul de Grauwe has written. He's very able to apply economics to everyday problems. And in addition to being a theoretical economist, Paul loves to apply economic concepts and ideas in policy debates. Education changes lives. A lecture, one single lecture, of Paul de Grauwe can change an individual's life. I was in his class some years ago, end of the 90s, and we were discussing a free market situation, but the free market was distorted by two constraints. Constraints such as tariffs, VAT, quota, whatever. And the main point of the lecture flow was that if you have a market with two constraints, if you take away one constraint, it doesn't necessarily improve the situation. Am I correct? I am correct. At that time, at that time, I had two girlfriends. <laughs> well, yes, two. I, at that time, I didn't see them as two constraints, but they convinced me that I should get rid of at least one constraint. After Paul's lecture, I got rid of the two constraints, which freed me up in the market just to marry the wife I'm still married to now. So thanks to Paul. <laughs> Serious now, to honor Paul de Grauwe for his contribution to the policy debates School of Business Economics at Maastricht University has decided to grant Paul de Grauwe the Europe Award. This award from SBE has been installed in 2002 for outstanding economists that have made major contributions to the public debate about the future of Europe. Not only via scientific publications, but also in newspapers and websites like Meiudice. This definitely applies to Paul de Grauwe, when Duisenberg, Jacques Dreze, Hans Werner Zinn have been granted the Europe Award before. We are proud to add Paul de Grauwe to this list. The prize is a sculpture, Johan. Could you hand over the sculpture? And next to the sculpture, there's a small amount of money that can be used to strengthen the cooperation between SBE and the institute that employs the receiver of the prize. The sculpture first. And of course, because you don't know where the sculpture is uh, going to end up, there is this which will probably um, end up in his office, either here in, uh, in Belgium or at, in London at the LSE. It is the official certificate of the Europe Award, and congrats, Paul. This is yours. Part 
it's time to go to work now. <laughs> there is a reception afterwards, which is offered to you by Studium Generale, but the most important thing is that I hand over the floor to Paul de Graal. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philip, for these uh, uh, nice words, uh, sometimes even romantic. <laughs> uh, I was very pleased to hear that I have been so influential in your romantic life <laughs> and so successful. It's also the first time that I'm remunerated before I work. <laughs> I very much appreciate uh, being uh, given this award. Uh, it's something that um, will certainly um, keep a place in my memory. Um, I have a long-standing uh, association with Maastricht, informal, in the sense of having come here very frequently and having enjoyed um, being here each time. I'm also particularly honored to be able to give this first lecture, um, honoring Johan Meisken. I think uh, um, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to do so. Um, I'm one of uh, those who are very close to Johan, not in the romantic sense that the dean <laughs> was referring to, but intellectually. Uh, we have been very close um, over the past, um, traveling similar roads um, in, in macroeconomics, uh, trying not to be dogmatic. Um, as, as you know, uh, at least this is my, my view, but uh, I think also yours, that uh, macroeconomics has uh, become too much uh, fundamentalist, um, and, and as a result has missed much of macroeconomic uh, dynamics that we have seen in the last uh, decade. And uh, I think uh, Johan Meisken is, is one of those who has been ready from the start to um, develop other types of models that uh, come closer to understanding the real world and that are also useful for economic policy making. That's why I'm so pleased uh, to be here and to be able to honor uh, Johan uh, in, in his uh, very rich career. So let me now start with um, the topic of my uh, talk. Uh, I've changed uh, the title somewhat, but uh, the content remains the same, uh, which has to do with uh, the Euro crisis and the way I want to talk about is first stressing the legacy of the sovereign debt crisis as we have seen it developing since uh, 2010, and then ask the question how we can deal with that in the future. So let me first say a few things about the outline of my presentation. I will first talk about the legacy of the sovereign debt crisis, right? um, and I will say a few things about how to deal with it, and then I will go to the core of my analysis, which has to do with the design failures of the Eurozone. So I will identify um, failures of design um, that uh, have been there in the Eurozone that we are still struggling to solve. And this then will lead me to the issue, uh, to the question how to redesign. I will talk about the central bank. What's the role of a central bank in a monetary union? This has been very unclear from the start, or at least we have we have created a central bank that was an ivory tower. It's amazing how practical policymakers could design an institution that was like an ivory tower, more ivory tower than academics, right? And then suddenly was confronted with the crisis and had to reinvent itself, right? Because the designers had not really taken care of these things. Then I will say a few things about macroeconomic coordination. And then at the end, I will start dreaming about political union. 
So let me start with uh, the legacy of the sovereign debt crisis. Here I show you um, the evolution of the net creditor and debtor position of Eurozone countries. What has happened as a result of the crisis is that the Eurozone has been split between creditor and debtor nations. And the way I, I show this is by constructing the cumulative current account positions of these countries. Right? Those of you, I guess you are all economists, but you may not remember everything. And if you are not an economist, let me explain what that means. So the current account um, measures the difference between spending of a country and production of a country. So if a country spends more than it produces, i.e. it has a deficit in its current account, it has to finance this by issuing debt. Like we individuals, when we spend more than we earn, we have to run a debt, or if we had saved in the past, we have to run down our savings, otherwise we have to go to the bank and obtain a loan from the bank. And the same is true for nations that accumulate current account deficits, they become debtors vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Um, the others that accumulate current account surpluses are the countries that um, produce more than they spend, and as a result, become net creditors to the others. And what we have seen over the years is a development where the, the USA has been split between debtor nations, here are the debtor nations, and the creditor nations. Well, who are the creditor nations? Not surprisingly, the Netherlands, but also Belgium, Germany. They have accumulated large surpluses in, in the current account. So in other words, they have spent much less than they have produced. And the Netherlands is in fact a champion in terms of surplus as a percent of GDP. It's now close to what? 10% of GDP. In other words, you produce 10% more than you spent. So you could spend much more. Right? <laughs> I will argue you should have done so. <laughs> and the same is true with Germany. And of course, when you do that, when you accumulate current account surplus, you become a net creditor. You are really lending to whom? To those who do the opposite, spending more than they produce. And these are the debtor nations. And what we have seen now, since the start of the Eurozone, a very strong divergence. Mainly countries of the periphery that have been gripped by boom and bubbles, have been spending a lot, and this was all financed by the creditor nations who were lending the money to their banking systems. And at a certain moment, this has led to a crash. It became obvious that some of these countries could not sustain the debt levels that they had accumulated. And then what happens is what usually happens in history, the creditor nations prevail. And they impose their rule, thy shall repay thy debt. In order to achieve this, they impose austerity. Austerity means bring back your spending so as to generate a surplus so that you can pay us creditors back. And here we come to the, the essence of the adjustment mechanism that has been imposed in the Eurozone since the sovereign debt crisis, which has been an asymmetric adjustment mechanism. The debtor nations have been asked to implement austerity so as to reduce their spending and as to generate surpluses without a compensating stimulus of the creditor nations. There you had the creditor nations with surpluses, a capacity to spend more, they didn't want to do that. And as a result, we have created an asymmetric adjustment mechanism that I will argue is at the core of the deflationary tendencies that have prevailed in the Eurozone. Here I show you some, some of the evidence of what I'm saying here. Um, here I, I, I present what is called the relative unit labor costs of individual countries. What do I mean by that? Well, each line represents the unit labor cost of a country divided by the average unit labor costs of the other countries in the system. So let's concentrate 
on this country here, that's Ireland. Right? During the period 2000, 2007, 2008, exactly, Ireland experienced a boom. Right? Um, boom in consumption, in housing, that led to very high price and wage increases. Much faster than in the rest of the Eurozone. And as a result, the unit labor costs of Ireland increased very fast relative to the rest of the Eurozone and led to an unsustainable situation, that is, a loss of competitiveness. The Irish found themselves in a situation where they had lost a lot of competitiveness. Right? At some point, this had to be corrected. And how do you correct this in a monetary union? You have to try to bring down wages and prices again. That's what the Irish started to do, right? Like this. We call that an internal devaluation in contrast to what Ireland and others would have done had they been outside the monetary union. In that case, they would have been able to devalue in one stroke, right? And bringing this line vertically down like this, right? Which is a less painful way than the way they were forced to do, that is, reduce prices and wages, which typically leads to a recession, because people have less wages to spend from, and as a result, production declines, unemployment increases, budget deficits increase, because governments automatically you know, um, spend more for unemployed, have less revenues, and they get into a deflationary process. And we see that most of these countries have gone through this process first a boom, spending boom, financed by debt, and then a necessity to correct by austerity, bringing down wages and prices, leading to a deep recession, an explosion of unemployment. So that has been the story of the debtor nations. Now, the point that I'm making is that the adjustment would have been easier for these countries had the creditor nations done the opposite. The question then is, have they done so? Here's the answer, nothing. Here's the same relative unit labor cost. Here you can see Germany, right? While the West was booming, during that period, Germany did an internal devaluation, reduced its wages and prices relative, but it could do it in an environment where the rest of the USO was booming. So it was easy stuff for Germany. Right? Now these same countries, the debtor countries, have to do an internal devaluation while Germany doesn't do anything. Or the Netherlands and the other creditor nations don't do anything. In other words, are not willing to stimulate their economy while they have the capacity to do so, since they spend much less than they produce, but they have been mesmerized also by this fundamental story that austerity is good. We should. In, in, in Dutch it sounds so much better, austerity, right? But um, sparsamheid, huh? it sounds much better than austerity. When you say sparsam, it has a moral connotation of virtue. Right? So in other words, these are virtuous nations, <laughs> while the other ones are not virtuous <laughs> nations. Right? But the, the upshot of all this has been an asymmetric adjustment mechanism, where as a result of these imbalances, the debtor nations have been forced to do austerity, while the creditor nations have been unwilling to do so. And as a result, the Eurozone as a whole became trapped in a deflationary process. Right? And here I show you the, the effect of all this. Um, this is the real GDP in the Eurozone, and I start in 2000 in the Eurozone, the US and the EU10. These are the countries in the European Union that decided not to be in the Eurozone. You would think, or we were told, if you decide not to be in the monetary union, it will be bad for you. It will be better to be in the monetary union. But look at this. Right? This is the Eurozone. 
First of all, you can see that prior to the, the crisis, the growth rate was similar but slower than in the other countries. But the important point is here, right? Uh, we have had the, the Great Recession in 2008-2009 as a result of the banking crisis. That has occurred everywhere. And then a recovery in the US and in the EU. No, that's the US. That's the EU-10. And in the Eurozone, stagnation. We still are below the level of GDP that was reached in 2008, while the other countries have gone out of this. So my interpretation is that it has everything to do with this asymmetric adjustment mechanism, where in order to take care of the imbalances, the debtor nations were forced to do austerity, while the others were unwilling to do the opposite, and as a result, has pushed down the Eurozone in, um, in stagnation and increasing unemployment. Here you see something similar, that's the Eurozone, the blue line, and in the other two, the EU10 and the US, since 2010-11, unemployment is going down. So bifurcation again uh, in these two parts of, of uh, the world. And, and, and finally, I show you, no, it's not finally, huh? um, I show you this here. Um, here you see how this came about. Right? This is the current account of the euro area as a whole. And you know that when a, a country, as I told you, has a current account surplus, it is spending less than it's producing. In other words, it is saving. It's a net saver. And here you can see what happened since the start of the crisis. The Eurozone in 2008 had a current account deficit of about 2% of GDP, turned into a current account surplus close to 3%. So here we had, while the economy was going down, everybody to try to save more austerity. Sparsament. Which meant, of course, that output was pushed down, unemployment was increased. But this was deemed to be virtuous. And then here I show you, as a, as a piece of evidence here, the, the deflationary process that led to a decline of inflation in the Eurozone uh, from about 2.5%, uh, 3% to now something close to zero, in fact a little negative since um, January 2015. And I contrast this with the US, where inflation has remained around 1.5% of, of uh, on a yearly basis. So here we have followed policies following the, the, the crisis that I think were ill-designed, um, reinforced uh, deflationary uh, dynamics, and in the end failed to solve the problem of the debtor nations. You, you may think that well, it was inevitable to do that. These countries, that the nations had accumulated too much debt, so they had to reduce it. So you have to do it. The question is whether the, the strategy that was employed, in fact, led to an improvement of the debt position of these countries. And the answer is, it didn't. Here I show you the debt to GDP ratio of these countries. And the crisis that started here, well, we can see that throughout this whole period of austerity, the debt to GDP ratio continued to increase. No surprise, if you do austerity strong enough, the debt to GDP ratio, right, the, the denominator is GDP. And if you do austerity strong enough, you destroy so much GDP that a given debt level just weighs more is a higher burden, and that's what this shows. So at the end of this whole process, we find out that these countries are now less capable of sustaining the debt, despite all this austerity. Maybe, in fact, as a result of this austerity, have been, become less able to service their debt, not more able, less able. Their debt to GDP ratios are, have now become unsustainable in many of these countries, also as a result of austerity. That is the real paradox, right? Not only have you imposed a lot of suffering to these countries with the millions of unemployed, 
especially young people that have no perspective in life, and at the same time we have not solved the basic problem, that is reducing the debt burden. In fact, the debt burden has increased in these countries. You couldn't do it worse. So my contention is that we could have done it better if we had followed a symmetric approach, right? as I already mentioned earlier. That would have reduced the cost of adjustment to the debtor nations. They could have achieved better results at lower costs, but we were unwilling to do so. Tina, that's not your girlfriend. No. <laughs> there is no alternative. That's what it means. There is no alternative, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah, many people have been saying there is no alternative to austerity. Yes, of course, it's true. Countries that have accumulated so much debt are forced at some point to reduce their debt level to make it sustainable, right? But the way it was done, there were alternatives to the way this was done. And I repeat myself, the way that it should have been done should have been a symmetric one, right? Uh, but then somebody would have been necessary to take a bird's eye view and look at the system as a whole, rather than every nation doing its own thing and not taking into account what's happening in the rest of the world. <laughs> so here we have certainly a failure. And, and who is responsible? Well, it's difficult to say. The European Commission one could have thought should have taken the lead, but was too much afraid of um, coming into conflict with some countries. Let me also say, I've already mentioned this, that there's a fallacy of composition here that we often find in macroeconomics, right? Uh, it's also at the core of what Keynes taught us about macroeconomics that has been forgotten uh, in, in modern macroeconomics textbooks. In modern macroeconomics textbooks, we have an individual a consumer, representative agent, who optimizes over his infinite lifetime, is perfectly informed, um, and as a result, what he's doing is individually rational, but also collectively rational, because it's a representative agent, they all do the same thing. And this form of fallacy of composition doesn't arise. What, what's the core idea of fallacy of composition? That is that sometimes, when you look at the individual, <coughs> what is in individually rational may cease to be rational at a collective level. Right? And that's what has been happening all over the place, and in particular in relations between countries. Right? Individual countries have been forced to do austerity, not taking into account what that means for the neighbor. And the neighbor, because one country is forced into austerity, finds itself with a reduction in exports, therefore less production, therefore less income, therefore higher budget deficits, and is forced into austerity. And does austerity irrespective of what the effects are for the rest. And as a result, what is individually rational ceases to be rational at a collective level. And that's why we need institutions at the European level to take a bird's eye view and to make sure that what is done at the individual level also becomes something that um, makes sense at the collective level. I'm a professor of political economy, so let me say a few things about um, political dimensions of all this. Right? And this has to do with legitimacy of governments. The, the kind of austerity that we have imposed in many countries right, in the Eurozone undermines the legitimacy of governments, because governments have been there um, also to protect people against vagaries of, of the market system. Um, the market system is a wonderful system, as Philip reminded us, that uh, we should all um, recognize it, but it's also a very unstable one. Right? And as a result, governments try to do something about this. But many, in many of these countries, governments have been prevented from doing this. 
and as a result, a political problem has arisen uh, in that people who vote for these governments reject the legitimacy of these, these governments that are perceived not to do the thing for which they were put there in the first place. Right? And that's a very dangerous situation to be in. So we have a connection here between austerity and political instability, something that is not in our economic models, right? Uh, when, when we think, and we economists think about uh, austerity in our economic models, we never put in the political dimension. But it's key, right? You cannot ask countries to go for 10 years to austerity, right? creating unemployment for many people, without taking into account that this may shake up political systems, that extreme parties will take over and telling people, let's do something else. Right? Um, they may be misleading. They are probably misleading. But surely they become a political force. That is what has happened in Greece. This is something that may happen in Spain and in other countries. Right? We shake up political systems because we undermine the political legitimacy of these governments. And that has not been taken into account in our um, programs of austerity. So what are the options for the future? First, we, we have to do something with the legacy of the EU crisis. I will say a few things uh, about this, and then I will turn to my major point, the design failures. Because as I will argue, much of what I've been saying is the result of essential design failures of the system that we have to uh, be aware of and then um, try to correct. So let me say a few things about how to solve the legacy problem, the, the, the debt problem, the overhang. In a number of countries, the debt is unsustainable. In Greece, the debt is unsustainable. We have to start recognizing this. Instead of telling the Greek, you have to repay the last penny. This does not make sense, right? because these governments just will not do it. At some point, the political cost for them to continue to do that uh, will be so great that they will say, we don't want to do it. Right? This is about sovereign debt crisis. We seem to forget this. Right? There is no higher court there that can force sovereigns to continue to service their debt. Right? So therefore, we have to restructure the debt, whether we like it or not. We have to be willing to say we will, we will take away some of the debt. Right? We, will we can find all different names to say the same thing. Restructuring of the debt, of debt forgiveness, uh, something like this. Right? So this is inevitable. Let me show you the, the debt Laffer curve. You may know the Laffer curve, right? which is a relationship between the government revenue and the tax tariffs. And it's also something non-linear. Right? If you tax too much, you, if, for example, if you tax 100% you take away everything from the citizens, well, they will not work anymore, uh, and as a result, the tax revenues will go down the drain, right? So it's non-linear. But you have something similar with the debt, a Laffer curve, a non-linear relationship. So what do I put here? Here I put, I look at the perspective of the creditor, right? the, say Germany or the Netherlands, who holds claims on a debtor, a debtor that has a lot of debt and could default, because this is a sovereign debtor that may decide if the cost of the debt service is too high, I just default. Right? So here's a creditor nation, um, and on the horizontal axis I set out the, the debt stock, the total amount of the debt. And on the vertical axis I set out the expected debt repayment. And here we find a similar non-linear relationship. If, as a creditor, you really insist that the debtor should repay the full amount, 100%, chances are that you get nothing. Because the debtor will decide the cost is too high. I default. And you get zero. There is an amount here, A, an optimal amount of forgiveness. If you say, okay, you only have to repay A, in other words, 
you forgive the amount AB. If you are forgiving, you maximize your expected debt repayment. And rational creditors will say, let's choose for A. And, and note the beauty of choosing for A, you maximize your profit and you are forgiving. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Instead of here being tough and taking a moral high ground and saying, you should repay everything because you were vicious. You have been bad without full repayment, and you get nothing. So moral high ground can punish you. So it's better to be forgiving, and you earn a lot. That, that's what we should do, I think. So that's the rational solution. That is the rational solution. Unfortunately, it's strange. This rational solution does not come out of the negotiations. The creditor nations, in the context of Greece, want full repayment. Right? Why is that? Because we have been virtuous, and the Greek have been sinning. They have sinned. They have to be punished. But that's the moral attitude. It, I call it a Manichaean view. You may know this Manichaean view. This is an old uh, philosopher, I don't know which century, um, who saw the world as being split between good and bad. We had good guys and bad guys. And here we are, the good part. And the bad are elsewhere, right? And they have to be punished, otherwise they will continue to sin. And that's the view that prevails too much in Northern. That was, and unfortunately, now in the case of Greece, most of the debt is now held by public authorities, right? Uh, the banks have been very clever. They were holding the claims on Greece. They have dumped it on the public authorities. The European Central Bank, the national banks, the governments, right? And now it's in the hand of public authorities. And public authorities somehow find it difficult to take this rational solution because they, they are gripped by this moralizing attitude that we should not do that because they will go on being bad. And this makes a, 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 a compromise very difficult. Right? I think we should have been able to come to a compromise with Greece but by insisting on full repayment. It's very difficult. Right? And at some point, the Greek will say, we will default. OK, so that's how we should deal with it. Um, debt restructuring, debt forgiveness. There are so many. Um, there are so many cases in history that have shown that if you take that view, it's best for the debtors and for the creditor nations. But as you know, sometimes countries are gripped by collective loss of memory, right? forgetting that they have been beneficial of debt forgiveness in the past right? and not willing to apply today. I now turn to the design failures of the Eurozone. What are these design fears? I have to go into that because it, it will make clear why we got into this trouble right? and, and how we should fundamentally deal with it. We have to, what I, what I argued is that we have to deal with the legacy, the debt crisis, but we have to do much more. We will have to deal with these design failures in the Eurozone. So what are these design failures? And here in a nutshell, um, I, I want to put it in the following way. I see basically three design failures. One has to do with dynamics of booms and busts in capitalism. I already said capitalism is a wonderful system. I'm not a communist, huh? And, and I do believe in capitalism, market system. They are the only system that have been able to create material welfare, right? Um, all the other things that we have tried have failed dismally, right? But capitalism is capable of doing so. But it is an unstable, very volatile system. And that creates a problem. And for monetary union, the problem that I see is the following. These booms and busts of capitalism, right? Sometimes you have optimism, euphoria, people spend, take on debt because they think it's great and we have fantastic uh, projects, etc., etc. Et and then the crash comes 
and and it becomes that pessimistic, depressive. So it, this is this manic depressive, right? Um, and now the thing is, the designers of the Eurozone thought that this system, this manic depressive system, would become a, a dynamics at the Eurozone level. Then we can more easily deal with it because we have one central bank that can then deal with this collective problem. But unfortunately, it, these movements of booms and busts maintained their national content and created huge divergences that I've shown in the beginning. Some countries experiencing a boom, others a recession. Right? So it was, there, was no, yeah, there was no convergence. And, and the, the architects of the Eurozone thought that when you are in a monetary union, it's like entering a big ship on the waves of the ocean. And we're all together on a big ship. Unfortunately, it was not a big ship. It was many different ships trying to stick together, but they couldn't. Right? And as a result, creating huge divergences that I've started with. That's one. The other has to do with stabilizers. In order to deal with this instability of capitalism, we have created in the past a number of stabilizers at the national level. When we created the monetary union, we eliminated the stabilizers at the national level and failed to create them at the Eurozone level. I will go into that in more detail to analyze what exactly I mean by that. Right? But, and that, of course, made it very difficult to manage such a system. And then finally, there was what is called a deadly embrace between the sovereign and the banks. When the sovereign gets in trouble, the banks are in trouble. Because the banks are holding this, the sovereign debt. And if the sovereign is in trouble, the value of the sovereign debt declines and the banks make large losses. And vice versa. In the case of Ireland, it was the banks that were in trouble and brought the sovereign also into trouble. Because the sovereign cannot allow banks to go down the drain, but the sovereign didn't have the financial resources to deal with it. So there's a deadly embrace when one of the two falls off the Cliff pulls the other one, and both disappear. OK, let me go a little more detail about these different um, design fields. I will concentrate mainly on the first and the second one. Booms and busts that remain national. You may say, why is that? Because we did centralize money. We created one central bank. Right? Wouldn't that have led to a situation where these booms and busts that are endemic in capitalism would automatically become a Eurozone boom and bust dynamics? Why didn't it happen? Well, I think the main reason is that most of macroeconomic policies were maintained at the national level and also institutions. So we maintained so much at the national level that the nation states continue to be the embodiment in which these movements could occur. Right? So we failed, in other words, to go much further. So that will lead me to my last point. In order to make this system work, you have to do much more than centralizing money. You have to centralize much of macroeconomic policies, budgetary policies, to avoid that. In the end, you continue to work with separate nations with individual booms and busts that you cannot control just by one central bank. And that, I think, was, was a basic failure. It, it illustrates the fact that we created something that is incomplete. It's like building a house and forgetting to have a roof on it. Right? So it's a nice house if it doesn't rain. And in this country, it rains a lot. Uh, so it, it's not comfortable much of the time. And that's what we, we seem to have forgotten. So we have to do a lot of work to deal with this. Second design failure, stabilizers. The absence of stabilizers. Let me ex explain what I mean by that. Here, I really mean the absence of a lender of last resort in government bond markets. Now, let me put it in, in, in the following context. Central banks were created in the past, 
it, the first central bank was in Sweden, then in, in England, and then later in other countries, mainly to deal with instability of financial markets, banking crisis all the time, collapses. I mean, history is full of that, collapses of financial system that usually bring huge misery to many, many people, right? Um, and that has been the driving force to create a central bank that is willing to provide liquidity to banks in times of crisis, but also to governments in times of crisis. Um, this was abolished, essentially, once countries became members of the monetary union, and the ECB did not take up that role, and therefore creating a potential for self-fulfilling crisis and bad equilibrium. Let, let me expand on this, because it may not be clear <coughs> immediately in the following way. Take a standalone country, take UK today. Right? It's not in a monetary union. The UK government, when it issues bonds, that gives an implicit guarantee to bondholders that the cash will always be there to pay them out at maturity. And why is that? Well, because there's the Bank of England backing the UK government. And the Bank of England will be forced to provide liquidity in the government bond market if the UK government is in trouble. If the UK government cannot find the cash. You have issued bonds at maturity, you have to find the cash to pay out the bondholders. Suppose at some point the UK government is short of cash. What is the UK government going to do? It will call in the governor of the Bank of England and tell him, it's always a him, um, <laughs> make me the cash. And the central bank can make all the cash of the world. And as a result, the UK government gives a credible guarantee to bondholders, don't worry, the cash will always be there. You can sleep comfortably, the cash will always be there. Now take a government of a member country of the Eurozone, any country. Let me take Spain. I don't want to take the Netherlands, but let me take Spain. The Spanish government is now part of the monetary union, and when the Spanish government issues debt, it issues debt in a currency which is de facto a foreign currency, the euro. It's a currency over which the Spanish government has no control. The Spanish government cannot, or the prime minister, cannot take the telephone and call Mario Draghi and tell Mario, give me the money. Mario will not even take the telephone. <laughs> As a result, the Spanish government cannot give a guarantee to bondholders. The cash will always be there. It's literally true that the Spanish government can be in a situation where there is no cash, cannot pay out the bondholder. And that can lead to a self-fulfilling crisis, which runs as follows, and which has run like this from 2010 on. You have a recession. <clears throat> what happens in a recession? Government revenues decline. Government spending has to increase because it's legislated to pay out the unemployed, and as a result, the budget deficit increases automatically, and the debt increases. Investors look at the numbers, and they say, this government has a high budget deficit, and its debt to GDP is increasing. Is this a safe government? Knowing that there is no central bank that will back up that government, these investors may say, that let's be conservative, and they sell the bonds. They sell the bonds. As a result, the yields increase. More importantly, liquidity is withdrawn from the Spanish market because those who have sold the bonds have acquired the euro and are likely to invest it in safe bonds, say German bonds, and the liquidity is withdrawn from the Spanish market with the liquidity squeeze from the Spanish government. The government cannot find the cash, cannot call Mario, and as a result, has a liquidity crisis. It is then forced, you know, to obtain the cash to introduce austerity 
as quickly as possible, raising taxes, reducing spending, making the recession worse. So here we come to a second stabilizer that is eliminated, the automatic budget stabilizers. They are there, right, in modern governments. So automatically in a recession, we'll see their budget deficits increase, and that's a good thing. It stabilizes. It means that the government will add purchasing power and reduce the intensity of the recession. But in such a system, you have to switch it off when? Exactly when there is a recession. And that creates a potential for countries being pushed into a bad equilibrium with deep recessions, high unemployment. Possibilities of default crisis, which start, what started as a liquidity crisis, can become a default price because the government will say, well, wait a minute, it is too costly to continue to service the debt. We default. Right? Countries can be pushed into a bad equilibrium because there is no support of a central bank. And that's what we need in a modern country and also in the monetary union. But initially, this was totally absent. Okay? So here, my analysis is about countries that are hit by a recession this pushes them into a liquidity crisis, and this can degenerate into a solvency crisis. So this was certainly the problem of countries like Ireland, Poland, and Spain. For, for Greece, I would say, well, this country was insolvent right from the start, but we didn't know because they had cooked the numbers. Um, and, and, and so there, I, I would say that then the central bank should not intervene. Right? But for the, the other cases, it, it should. So here we are, the absence of a land of last resort in, in government bond market um, led then also to eliminating the, the automatic stabilizers from the budget and pushing countries into um, solvency problems, bad equilibria, and all that. So this is a world where the system can generate more than one equilibrium. Um, it's very different from standard macroeconomics where these are linear models, you have only one equilibrium in the, in the main say, the, the standard macro model. I, I know there are other models that don't do that, but the, the mainstream macroeconomic model, right? You have demand and supply, only one, one equilibrium. But in the real world, you can have multiple equilibria, right? Because there are self-fulfilling processes there that can push you into a bad equilibrium and some countries into a good equilibrium. And that is when public institutions should interfere, right? To push countries towards a good equilibrium. So that's the power of governments or central banks, and that should be used. So how do we design the Eurozone? I will talk about the role of the ECB. I'm, I'm carried away so much that I forgot how much time I, I can go on doing this. Uh, OK, yeah. <laughs> OK. You know, sometimes I lose any notion of time, and it's good that you. No worries. <laughs> okay. Okay, so how do we design the Eurozone? I will talk about the role of the ECB, coordination of macroeconomic policies, and political union. Right? How do we deal with these design things? The role of the ECB is the role of the ECB is already implicit of what I've been saying up to now. Right? You need in the Eurozone a backup, somebody willing to back up governments in times of crisis. That is a willingness to provide liquidity if governments are hit by liquidity crisis. Of course, you may say, well, it's difficult to make a distinction between liquidity problems and solvency problems. I've mentioned to you Greece and the others. Greece was insolvent. Then you shouldn't do that. You should restructure the debt. But the other countries, like Spain, Portugal, uh, Ireland, were solvent nations. I think they are solvent nations, but they're hit by a liquidity crisis that deteriorated into a solvency problem. And that's when the central bank should inter intervene and say, we are willing to, to provide liquidity in times of crisis to prevent countries from being pushed by markets into a bad equilibrium. And the, the markets have this potential of doing this. Note, basically, s something that is quite paradoxical right, when you think about it. When we were told that we would be in a monetary union, we were also given the impression that, oh, since we are in one club together, we will be stronger. Huh? Uh, L'Union fait la force, something like this, right? 
It's the other way around. By becoming members of a monetary union, each of these members became weaker, more fragile. Precisely because the backup that existed at the national level, provided by the central bank, was taken away. And nothing was put at the level of the Eurozone to take the place of these national backup systems. It took the ECB some time to understand this. But finally, in 2012, the ECB did exactly this with this OMT program that um, Mario Draghi announced, it's called Outright Monetary Transactions, uh, which was essentially a promise that the ECB made, saying that in times of crisis, I, the ECB, am willing to provide all the liquidity of the world, that is, willing to buy all the bonds necessary to stabilize the market. And a central bank can do it. Right? The ECB could technically buy all the government bonds of all the member countries of the US. I'm not saying it should do that, but it can do it. Right? It just put it on its balance sheet and creates money base. It's, it's balance sheet explodes. Again, I'm not saying it should do it, but the fact that it can do it creates an insurance mechanism that one worked wonderfully. Here I show you the spreads. These are the differences in the government bond rates of uh, member countries right, with the government bond rate of Germany. 10-year government bond rates. And here, the crisis started here, right? Panic in the markets. Investors sold these bonds. As a result, the spreads increased. This is Greece here. This, I think, is, uh, what is that? Uh, Portugal. Portugal, yeah. And then the other, Spain, um, Ireland, right? A huge surge in these spreads. This was um, investors selling the bond spreads. Yields increased. Liquidity was withdrawn. We got into a crisis. In 2012, the survival of the Eurozone was at stake. And the ECB was not in, a, in a, a suicide mode. And therefore decided that it's time to intervene. So he really had to put the ECB there over the cliff, right? And then these people didn't want to fall off. And then they said, we will act. And they acted. And look at what happened. The spreads collapsed. And the nice thing about all this is that the ECB did not have to buy one euro of these bonds. It was just a confidence trick. The fact that the ECB promised to do something made it unnecessary to do it. That's really beautiful, isn't it? Uh, you, you just promise, I will do this. And everybody believes you will do it, and therefore you don't have to do it. <laughs> it's like a magical trick. <laughs> It doesn't happen often in life that you can do these things, right? Uh, promise to do something, and then you don't have to do it, precisely because you promised. So but that's what the ECB managed to do, a great success. It stabilized the, the Eurozone, right? And, and, um, and, and so that certainly has been, it, it came a little too late. I would have done it earlier, but, but surely it was done. And so that's the great merit of Mario Draghi um, to, to do it. Then again, the ECB waited a little too long, for my taste, in, in January 2015, in order to fight deflation. It started with the QE program, right? Um, they actually started buying government bonds, a monthly purchase of 60 billion, so as to stop these deflationary forces that I documented earlier to you, right? Uh, and here um, I, I show you why the ECB, in a sense, was forced to do so. Here, I show you the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, the blue light, and the ECB from, the, from 2004. Here you have the start of the banking crisis, October 2008. And then you see that both the ECB and the Fed expanded their balance sheet. What was going on? Well, the, the, the Fed and the ECB tried to save the banks. So they took assets from the commercial banks and um, credited the accounts of the commercial banks. In other words, created money, right? And, that, um, and you see this expansion here. 
But for some reason, since 2013, or the end of 2012, the ECB started to contract its balance sheet again, while the Fed was expanding it. Just at the time, the Eurozone was in a new recession, so this was certainly ill-designed. But now the ECB corrected this and, and said, well, we are going to expand our balance sheet by one trillion, which means that this point will go to this point. Still far away from what the Fed has done. But this is also a positive development. I think it was necessary that the ECB did that to sustain economic activity in, in the Eurozone. Okay. Let me skip a few things um, as a result of, of, of time constraint. Uh, I have to maybe, uh, uh, let me, me skip uh, this. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, Philip is looking at me with uh, very uh, eyes that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think I shouldn't talk too long because I also want to have some discussion later. Let me switch to, so I've been, I've been talking about the role of the central bank, the European Central Bank, and, and the necessity to have a lender of last resort, not only for the banks, but also for um, uh, governments in the government bond markets. What about macroeconomic policy coordination? As I told you in the beginning, we have seen divergent developments in economic activity. Some countries experiencing a boom, others a recession, the booming countries accumulating too much debt. So there is a case for more coordination of the system, right? making sure that we don't diverge so much. And, and something has happened here. So we have moved forward in that the European Commission now has become responsible for monitoring a number of macroeconomic variables so as to prevent these divergent movements. For example, monitoring current account balances competitiveness measures, bank credit, house prices, so as to, 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 to push countries into common macroeconomic policies, so to avoid these imbalances that accumulated in the past. However, what we observe today, it is very difficult to implement that in a symmetric way. We have seen, for example, that it's much easier for the European Commission to go to deficit countries, countries that have a deficit in their current account, and tell them you have to reduce your current account deficit, then going to countries that have a surplus and telling them you should reduce your surplus. Why is it so much more difficult? Well, it has again to do with this moralizing attitude. Countries that have a surplus think of themselves, they are virtuous. If you have a surplus, you are doing good things. Why should we be told by the European Commission to change while we are virtuous. And that makes it politically very difficult. And Germany refuses this. The Netherlands also refuses to be told and to say to do something on the surplus. The Netherlands has the highest surplus as a percent of GDP and is not willing to, do, to change anything to that, right? No stimulus, right? What the Netherlands should do is to stimulate its economy, spend more. You spend too little. You, um, I, I was, I think it was the, the governor of your central bank who said recently in an interview that uh, the, the Dutch live beyond their means. I said, this cannot be true. The, the Dutch live below their means. They don't spend enough. They produce much more than they spend. So it's time to enjoy life. And spent more. <laughs> so, so I think this coordination thing is important. I think we should strive to get more symmetric approaches to, to policy making. It's also going to be important to, to, to work at, at, at the level of um, the, the business cycle of the Eurozone as, as a whole. Um, and I think the key here is public investment. Um, as a result of austerity programs, public investment has gone down almost everywhere, especially in the Eurozone, and that doesn't make sense, right? Um, as a result, so yeah, the previous slide, I was showing you the, the public investment as a percent of GDP, which has gone down as a result of austerity. So it's time to start doing public investment. 
Germany is the, the candidate country where you can do it, but also the Netherlands, right? Uh, and, and when you think about it, you can now borrow for free. Suppose a, a private company that has investment projects and can borrow for free, for nothing, zero, you don't have to pay. No private company that has some common sense would just refuse to borrow. Of course they would borrow. And here we have governments that refuse to borrow. Although there are quite a lot of I mean, investment needs in this country, in other countries. They don't want to do it because it's sin to borrow. <coughs> so we have to throw away these dogmas. One of these dogmas is balanced budget. You have to balance the budget. That's virtuous. That means you cannot issue bonds to finance public investment. That's what balanced budget means. Huh? You cannot issue new debt. So even if you have good investment projects, you should finance this by current revenue. Suppose we were to impose to private companies the rule that says that investment can only be financed by current revenue. Where would we stand today in the Middle Ages? Capitalism is about people having interesting investment projects and then borrowing the money. That's how you get rich. You create leverage and you have a little bit of your own money. The rest is borrowed, so you get a lot of leverage and you get very rich. That's capitalism. That's how we expanded material welfare. So if you were to impose this rule to private companies, I said we, were, we would be in the Middle Age, I think we, we would be in the Stone Age. <laughs> That's a rule that we impose on governments. It just doesn't make sense. There is no reason why governments that have good public investment projects should not be able to borrow, especially today when you can borrow for free. So we have to throw away these dogmas. These are dogmas that, that really prevent us from doing the rational thing, right? It's all influenced by this kind of almost religious attitude vis-a-vis -vis that and all that. And finally, now I told you I'm going to dream a little bit. I think, let me, let me summarize what I want to say here in, in the following way. The euro is a currency that um, has no country in which it is embedded. So it's a currency without a country. And, and therefore, we will have to create a country to, to sustain that currency. There is no other way. Right? If we don't want to create that country, then the euro will just not continue to last. So that's the basic uh, long-term perspective we have. We should have no illusions. If we do not create a political union in Europe, then this will not last. Let me go, I, I will um, skip the, the banking union, but right away to political union. What do, we, what do I mean with political union? I essentially mean some kind of fiscal union. We should bring together some of the tax power and spending power at the European level, right? So that we create a European authority that is at par with the central bank. Um, it's also a way to create, uh, to, to bring together national debts into a consolidated European debt, and as a result, reduce the fragility that I was talking about, where you have all these national governments <coughs> issuing their own debt, right? and then being unable to sustain that, except if the ECB is willing to interfere, but the problem with that is that the, the ECB cannot be forced to do so, and, and as a result, it is not uh, a system that can be maintained. We will have to create a European government that is at par with um, the ECB. And, and finally, a fiscal union is also a way to create some insurance mechanism, transfers between countries, right? When you are in a union, you cannot say to each other, if you are in trouble, don't count on me. It's like a marriage. Suppose you, 
you want to marry and you write a contract and you would write down to your, for your partner, if you are in trouble, don't count on me. Will that marriage last? Probably not. Right? The same with the monetary union. Right? Some countries are bound to be put into trouble at some point. If we say to each other, don't count on me, then this union will not last. In fact, that's what we do today. Don't count Greek, don't count on me. Right? But such a union will not last. The Greek will say, hell. But this will repeat itself. At some point, it will be another country that is driven into economic despair. Are we going to say each time, it's your fault, don't count on me. Then this union will disintegrate. So we need this kind of fiscal union that organizes automatic insurance mechanism. This creates lots of problems. Moral hazard, for example, right? If we do this, we create moral hazard. So you also need discipline. You also need mutual control. But you need the kind of insurance, the two together. What we have created now is just the disciplining part. The stability and growth part is the disciplining mechanism that you need if you have an insurance mechanism. We only have the disciplining part not the insurance mechanism, and that cannot last. So we have to move forward to create a political and fiscal union. But that's going to be very difficult, right? The willingness today to move in that direction is uh, non-existent, right? And that continues to make the Eurozone a fragile institution. So, and to conclude, let me just say the following. The long-run success of the Eurozone depends on the, the continuing process of political unification. And such a political unification is needed because the Eurozone has dramatically weakened the power and legitimacy of nation states without creating a nation at the European level. That's probably the core of the problem. By creating this monetary union, we have weakened the power and the legitimacy of nation states, but we have not created a nation at the European level that can take the place of these weakened nation states. And this cannot last. And as a result, I must conclude, although I am an optimist, the Euro crisis is not over. Thank you for your attention. Take questions. Okay, sure. Yes, yes. Who's first? Yes. Wait for the microphone. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for the insightful lecture. I have a question about the design uh, failures, as you discussed, but you didn't discuss the third point that I'm actually interested in. So uh, my question is that if uh, I read one of your uh, article about financial market structures and you discussed the, if the, uh, the trade-off between uh, <coughs> universal banking system and very narrow banking system. So uh, recently we saw that Basel III implemented like move towards the universal banking system and regulating by imposing uh, uh, leverage ratios, measure capital ratios, measure and identif uh, <laughs> identifications of the systemic important institutions. But uh, on the other hand, those banks also increase the general risk in the system, and some of them become uh, like not, are not able. Some nations are not able to sustain those banks. On the other hand, we have the narrow bank, uh, narrow banks, which uh, are exposed to idiosyncratic risk. So, do you think that is there an optimal market structure, or we are still divided, and it's not easy to answer for that? Well, I, I, as you know, there has been a big discussion um, about um, whether we should separate investment banking from um, commercial banking, right? I, I, I tend to take the view that um, we, we should try to, to keep these things separate. Um, 
because mainly the, the main reason is that banks, traditional banks, are inherently um, fragile because they're both short and lent long. And therefore, they are prone to collective movements of um, distrust that can bring down the whole banking system. And that's why you have to make sure that commercial banks do not take too much risk on their balance sheet. What I found out since then is that it's extremely difficult to do so. Um, the, the lobby of the banks just doesn't want to do it. And, and we have seen that they are very powerful and, and it's, it doesn't go in that direction. It has not gone in that direction. So I think we should try to do other things. And um, I, I believe that the most promising single change is really to impose that banks hold more capital, whatever, whether they are investment banks or commercial banks. They still hold too little capital. Uh, as you know, of course, there is this Basel uh, tree, and the previous Basel um, accords, uh, agreements, that are all based on, on risk-weighting um, assets. And I think that's not, well, it can be done, but Banks can so can manipulate that so much, and, and we have seen that um, banks that have very little capital still manage to have these risk-weighted capital ratios that are quite high, and, and then um, tell us that uh, they, they have done a great effort in increasing their <coughs> their equity. So I think we we should really impose much more drastic measures here. And, and tell the banks, for example, um, it's sometimes called the leverage ratio. You have to reduce your leverage ratio dramatically. What you see today is that in countries like the, the Germany, also the Netherlands, Belgium, you take the, the balance sheet of the major banks, right, and then you look at their equity, it's still only 5% of their balance sheet. Right? Now, I don't know well-run companies outside the banking sector that only hold 5% of their um, balance sheet in, 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 in equity. Right? So that's a hugely risky position. It's enough that you have a relatively small shock on the value of these assets of these big banks are, are broke again. So we really have to push them to hold much higher equity ratios. And I'm really thinking of then 20%, right? As existed in the past, it's not something that cannot be done, because in the past, banks had equity ratios of that size. So we really have to go back to that and, and, and push them in, in that direction. That's probably the simplest possible um, way to deal with the problem. But again, of course, banks will resist it, right? They, they resist change, yeah? so we, we really have to fight them. Other questions? Yes, here at the front. I'm watching. Um, hello. Um, I didn't understand really your answer of why uh, the, the QA program. The what? The, the Q QA. So the, the QE, yeah. QE, you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to be sure. Um, what I saw was uh, the balance sheet of America uh, grows uh, very much. In Europe, it doesn't. Yeah. And uh, you say uh, Europe, the ECB, should do what uh, America do does. But what is the importance of such a huge, huge balance sheets of uh, trillions of uh, euros? I don't understand. You okay. didn't expand I, it. Um, if I said that we should do like the US, I didn't mean that we should do it like the US because it's the US that did it. I mean, I think there is a case to be made um, to do it. And the case is based on another graph that I showed you, namely inflation that has gone down to a negative number. I showed you. Um, now, remember, the ECB has announced that it wants to keep inflation close to 2%. That's the objective of the ECB itself. Since more than two years, inflation is now considerably below. So therefore, 
according to the own objectives of the ECB, it should do something to raise inflation. And there's, there are good economic reasons why a negative inflation is not a good thing to have. And that something like 2% inflation is much better to live with. There are many economic theories about this. I'm not going to go into that, but that's a, a key understanding. So how does a central bank raise the rate of inflation? The only way I know is by creating more money. There's no other way, except if you tell me how you can do it without creating money, well, that's it, right? In fact, I mean good company. Milton Friedman, the Pope of monetarism, told us that if you want to create inflation, you have to create money. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And the reason why inflation went so much down has much to do with the fact that the money stock, the money base, went down. So it's time for the ECB to reverse that. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's, it's a, let me put it this way. It's necessary that the ECB does this. It's not sufficient. Other things have to happen also. For example, more investment, more public investment, to boost economic activity. If the ECB, if the only thing that happens is QE by the ECB, that is probably going to be insufficient. It's still necessary. The fact that it is insufficient doesn't mean that it is unnecessary. Now, let's be logical about these things. Something can be necessary and insufficient, but you should not reverse it and not say, ah, it's insufficient, therefore it's not necessary. It is necessary. There's no, no other way to do it. And I think what the ECB has announced is not excessive. Right? When you look at the announcement, when you, you look at the trend line, when you start from 2004, right? the money base has a red line. The money base is now below the trend line. Right? So all the ECB is trying to do is to bring the money base back to its trend line. I think it's sensible policy to do. So, uh, Professor, you said that there were two things that should be achieved, a banking union and a fiscal union. However, I didn't quite get what are the plans. Is there some political initiative for a fiscal union? Is there the political courage to counter a little bit of that banking lobby that's so strong that will prohibit the... Um, the banking union. Is there some plans for the fiscal union? Um, okay, for, for fiscal union, there is practically nothing. Um, what, what has happened with the previous president of the European Council, Herman Van Rompuy, uh, he presented a document that was a kind of blueprint to create some fiscal space at the eurozone level. Right? So, some embryo of a fiscal union. He presented it to the Council of Ministers and they politely told him that it's a great document and then went to the next issue. Um, so we are nowhere. There's no, no movement in that direction. In terms of banking union, yes, we have made progress. I skipped uh, what I wanted to say because of time constraints. But uh, let, let me just summarize this, what we have done. We have created um, a beginning of a banking union. Essentially, as you probably are aware of, um, a common supervision by the European Central Bank. Right? The European Central Bank is now going to be, or is now, the, the, the single supervisor um, in, in the Eurozone. And I think that's a good step forward. Uh, we need a common supervision, but it's not enough. Right? So it's necessary again, but not enough. Uh, what we have not done um, is the, the insurance part. Um, so essentially what many countries or most countries have is a deposit insurance mechanism. And the initial idea of a banking union was to, to, to have a, a common deposit insurance mechanism, right? where we would bring together all the funding and as a result when one of the countries or one of the banks in the Eurozone uh, where to fail, then the common 
mechanism would take care of this. Right? Very much like exists in the United States, where you have the Federal Deposit Insurance System, FDIC, that takes care of this. And that is quite important because it allows to disentangle the fate of the sovereign and the bank. Right? If the, the, the banks are in trouble and you keep the deposit insurance mechanism at the national level, then you are going to create problems for the sovereign. The, 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 the idea here is to spread the insurance over the whole union, and as a result, you, you take away this um, devilish embrace between the sovereign and, and the banking sector. And that we have not managed to do up to now. And then finally, the, the third leg in a banking union is the, the resolution mechanism. When banks are in trouble, you want to resolve the problem. Um, and typically, a resolution of a banking problem consists in splitting the bad um, assets from the bank, right? put it separately, and then recapitalizing what is left over so that you can have it as a, uh, a, a new bank that can continue to, to function. But that usually necessitates um, funding, and that this must come from governments. And um, so we have now created a common resolution fund, but it's so tiny, so small, that uh, it would not even have been enough to deal with the, the Fortis debacle. Right? So um, we, have, we are going in the right direction, but it's still uh, a long way to go. So but at least there, there is some progress. Just yes, one, two, and then front by Professor Matsky. Hey, thanks for the lecture. Um, so, <laughs> you spoke about the, the Laffer curve, about the optimum point between uh, demanding repayment and forgiveness. In the UK, and I can imagine several other countries, there was a general public perception that governments forced banks to pay a minuscule amount back, <laughs> considering the instability they caused. Do you yeah. think that this is an instance of the Laffer curve in effect, or do you think it's governments just being spineless in the face of big business? Yeah. Uh, okay. Is there another question? No. You say. Uh, okay. Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, I'm. I'm not sure. This is a, an application of the debt Laffer curve that I have here, which is essentially a notion about sovereign debts, right? Um, but what you are mentioning in the case of the UK, but this has happened in many other countries, that is that um, banks have been saved by governments without um, sufficient penalty right, to, to make sure that they will not start all over again. It's a moral hazard issue that has arisen. Um, and it has to do with the um, too big to fail syndrome, right? Uh, we know that um, big banks are a danger for society because they are big and therefore sovereigns and governments cannot afford to let them down and banks know that and as a result they will take too much risk. And, and so that we have to counter. And, and so the, the way to do it, I mentioned this imposing more capital ratios, probably other things that we have to do uh, to avoid that they take on too, too much risk. But, but surely uh, we have been too lenient vis-a-vis -vis bankers uh, after the, the crisis, and, and too many have gone away uh, unhurt, which I think uh, has been a, a mistake. One but last question. Last question is for Professor Maxwell. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your lecture. My question is a bit more technical. Uh, you spoke about the central bank, or the Bank of England in this case, and that it is, it's not independent. It's dependent, obviously, on the government of England, or Britain. Um, but at the same time, for example, the central bank of Germany has always been independent. Um, and it's been very successful with that model. And I mean, that's also what, on what the ECB is formed on. Do you think that that model then is, is flawed, or would you just think that the ECB model is flawed and the, the German version of it worked only for the Germans but not for Europe? 
No, no, I don't believe there is something special about Germany <laughs> that we should have special institutions for Germany and not for the rest. But I understand your point. I think it's a very important one. Um, we, we have come to realize over the years that there is a great benefit in having independent central banks. And, and surely it has to be said that the Bundesbank has been the model of a central bank that, because of its independence, has been able to maintain monetary stability in Germany for the post-war period. And, and as a result, uh, the Bundesbank has become the prototype for many others, in particular also for the ECB. But independence always has limits. Right? Never, cannot be absolute. Why is that? Well, we live in democracies, and therefore, independence is granted by the democratic process, or should be granted by the democratic process. Here we have voters that vote for a particular parliament and executive and government. These governments have to delegate part of their power to independent institutions like central banks, but they also have to make sure that there is accountability. Right? Because they have received the power from the voter, and they will be called accountable for errors that are made by these institutions to which independence has been granted. So we always so independence can never be absolute. There must be a system of accountability um, that is key. So that's one element. The other element is that in times of crisis, when the sovereign is at stake, we cannot allow that unelected officials determine the fate of governments that are elected democratically. We just don't want this. Right? And in times of crisis, therefore, governments will overrule the independence, and rightly so. So therefore, again, there is, independence cannot be absolute. I would say in normal times, right? that's most of the time, in our normal times, you want a central bank to be independent, to set to, to, to announce an inflation rate and do all the things necessary to keep inflation close to the announced rate. Right? But in times of crisis, you have to say, sorry, Central Bank, there are priorities here. I will overrule everything. And I command you now to provide liquidity. Right? Um, and, and that is, I think, inherent in, in central banking. It's also inherent in the system in which we live. We know that in capitalism there will be booms and busts and, and crashes, and we cannot allow governments to be brought down while we have the means to avoid this. That is a central bank that has the capacity to deal with this. So then, therefore, at that moment, we have to overrule independence. You are. Thank you very much for your very nice lecture, Paul. Um, my question is quite complicated for, for myself, so maybe it's not fully... Uh, fully Can I clarify? <laughs> <laughs> um, you approached... My question is twofold, in a way. First of all, you very rightly pointed out that the Eurozone undermines the legitimacy of governments, and the mandate is ero eroded, in particular because of austerity measures. And in the end, you suggested or briefly mentioned that we should have a more national, a pan national level at the European level. And my question is twofold. On the one hand, do you think in terms of United Nations of Europe in a way? So will the nation state disappear and be taken over by a European wide nation? That's part of my question. The other part of my question is, and this is what I also point out in classes, is that in my perception, and I would, I would like to see your view on that, is that the euro is, and the euro area is not only a technical issue, the way you presented it more or less, but also stands for a lot of 
a deeper meaning in a way. We should realize that Greece had the Portugal had the colonial regime till when Portugal had a colonial regime, Spain had colonial regimes. So all these countries joined the euro also for different purposes. And this is also what you see for new member states, which are definitely willing to go through great sacrifices to be part of the euro area. These are not mainly economic, or not only economic stories, but also deeper stories in a way. So in, in a way, my two questions are connected. Mm. I hope you see them. Yeah, I think they are very much connected. Um, so let, let me try to, to answer um, your questions. Um, I, I do think that a monetary union has to lead to one European state. Those who think that we can have it the way it is, that is one currency, and essentially nation states that here and there are limited in their sovereignty, but not fundamentally, that's not a model that can last. Um, a, a, a monetary union is extremely intrusive in terms of need to change institutions. And we will be confronted with that. Um, even if we solve the present crisis, this will come back to us. Right? It's something very incomplete. And therefore, it is key. The logic of a monetary union is the creation of one nation state. Of course, it doesn't have to be a centralized nation state, right? We can certainly try to look for federal structures so that we keep quite a lot still at the national level. But surely, we have to go way beyond what we have today. Today, the budget, the European Union budget is 1% of GDP. So that's not a European fiscal union, right? Uh, we have to go way beyond that. Um, but we are so far from that today that uh, um, it's difficult to see how that can be achieved. But we will certainly be confronted with that choice. So there is a, a, a link between economic and, and political necessities here. They are not separate. And that brings me to your second question. Um, much of the driving force of countries when they joined the Union were not in the first instance economic. Right? You mentioned there Greece and, and Portugal, but there are other examples like, well, take, take Finland. Why the hell did Finland want to join? Well, for political reasons, right? They, they, they don't like Russia, and, and, and anything that will link them more to the West is welcome. Right? Now they start discussing maybe to join NATO. Um, so, so these are essentially non-economic reasons why Finland, as another example, joined the um, monetary union. But that again brings the tension between politics and economics. Uh, if the main motivation is political, um, then you may encounter problems on the way, like we have seen. Right? So we have to bring politics and economics together, and, and the only way is to to embed a, a, a union, a currency union, into a political union. And so we are condemned to do so. If we don't want to do it, then we will say, we have to say goodbye. What happens here? The, the laughter curve is moving. <laughs> OK, thank you. and this is uh, the first of the Johan Muisken lectures, but hopefully I'm certain also that it is not going to be uh, your last lecture here at our school. This is yours, you join him not only this bottle, uh, but for the reception at Ad Fundum. So, uh, see you there.